I've been talking in recent videos that I got this next major project that I'm working on. Well, I got a mock-up of it right now for testing purposes, and it's time to give you a little more information about what we're going to lead into in future videos. Um, what I'm building is a hybrid supercapacitor battery pack for cars. Um, this way, you can get rid of the lead acid part, and I'm basically expanding upon Laser Saber's work, where he just took six supercapacitors, put them in series, and started cars with it. And then later on, he also added a lithium iron phosphate little RC battery pack to it, so this way the supercapacitors wouldn't always drain down from the parasitic loads that's on the car. And it worked great, but he forgot one major thing with that, and that is... When you start a car, even though the supercapacitors are going to take probably 90% of the jolt of amperage that is needed to start a car, he didn't limit the amount of current that can come from that battery pack. And the easiest way to do that is with one of these. This is a 200 watt rated half ohm resistor. And that goes between the supercapacitors and the batteries. Now for testing purposes right now, I'm using an old lead acid. I haven't gotten my lithium iron phosphate batteries in yet, but I'm going to bring it in a little bit closer. I'm going to show you the setup I have mocked up here and continue with the work that Laser Saber did. So let's get closer. Okay, so here we are on the bench, and this is the center of the unit. This is a control unit with a display right here. And what this does is it allows power to come in from the battery over here on the side and it comes back in through the center and this will give me a readout of basic information also has a 30 amp relay that runs in between which will cut the power off if the voltage goes too low in the battery or the amperage draw goes too high it's basically a nice way to keep an eye on the whole unit this is not required for this system, but I oh, I love seeing what's going on with it. So I put this in the middle, and I could give a full review on this unit, but Julian has already made a great review on this unit itself, and I'll put a link of it probably like somewhere right around here, or around here, somewhere around here. And go ahead and check his video, and he will show you how this unit actually works. I'm going to show you real quick what I did to modify it because originally with the screen on all the time and the way this unit is shipped, it will pull over 100 milliamps very easily and I made it so it pulls when the screen turns off and it goes into sleep mode, which basically just go th down to set, which I'm at. There we go, no glare. And you just keep clicking it until it says display time off. Just set it for five seconds or whatever, and the screen will turn off. That kills about 20 milliamps right there. So now the screen is in sleep mode, and it still records information. The other things I did, normally you have to put power. Uh, this unit is actually rated for anywhere between 12 to 48 volts, so you got to put 12 volts in here. Since I'm still working on a 12 volt system, I bypassed that. I cut the trace over here. Let me get my little tweezers. I cut this little trace right here, which eventually went to ground, and this trace right over here that eventually went over to positive. And I directly ran power positive that goes to the electronics from this pin, and it runs over and actually connects into right here, the output positive. Now the reason I put it over here, instead of over here, is I also wanted to see its own load on the screen. So. Like right now, if I wake it back up, it's going to tell me, see, we're pulling 90 milliamps right now. Now, that's the combined amount of power being used from this and also keeping this supercapacitor pack charged right now because this is already on. So, if you put the positive that was over here over to the battery side, it won't record it. It's before this shunt that actually records the power going through it. So I put it over here and I just hit it. The ground here is actually just ground to ground. So I just cut that trace, don't even use it type of deal. The other major modification I did to it is over here on the side, actually two modifications. One, since this is a relay, all relays 
usually pull around 30 to 50 milliamps when the coil is activated and the relay is actually on. And it's on right now because you can see the little LED light on. So I can turn it off just as easy. Click. There, it's off right now. And now it's back on. Well, when that switch is on, this pulls an extra 50 milliamps originally. Now it only pulls about 20 to keep this on. And the easiest way to do that is on this little four pin connector right here, this very last wire goes to the relay coil. I cut in the middle of it and put a, the equivalency of 280 ohms resistance and a, I think it's a 400, yeah, 470 microfarad capacitor. This makes a really simple RC filter. So when you put power to it and turn on the relay, it immediately gives it the 12 volts it needs to get it started, but then it drops it down to about five volts and almost no power. Once a relay is activated, its holding power is a lot less than what is needed. So I'm not sure if the camera will pick it up. Let me turn it off. And you should see a momentary really bright on the screen. It's only like 30 or 50 milliseconds long for the LED and then it gets dim and just stays there. I'll try one more time. But it gets really bright real quick and then it fades down to where it is. That's the RC filter. It allows the full 12 volts to go to this relay just to get it to switch over and then it calms it on down, and that saves about 20 milliamps right there of power. The other last thing I did, actually, sorry, two more things I forgot. You can save another three or four milliamps because these are supposed to be wireless, and you can run them wireless or wired. Well, here's the wireless. They're the NLRF chips or wherever they are. Yeah, I ripped them out. I'm putting this in a car. I can run wire from where I'm going to put this battery pack up to the screen. That saved about three milliamps worth of wasted power with these not doing anything and just sitting in there. So yeah, I ripped those out. Okay, and the final mod is, they usually give you this little USB cable if you want to do a wired version to the screen. Let's see, originally I have it back in here. And you run USB from, it used to sit right here if you look in Julian's video. And it will plug into the back of the screen and they'll give you a wire connection. It sucked. It, the cable they give you or these things are terrible. You never get a good connection. So I hardwired it. I ripped out that connector that was over here, ran some Cat5 cable over to the screen. And that gave the screen a nice solid amount of power. I don't get any flickering out of it. I don't lose any, any uh, information on it. It worked great. It, what do you expect? The unit itself cost $25, so they had to cut corners somewhere. So I'm just re-improving the unit. Now, since I am going to put probably this whole battery pack in the trunk of my car, but I want the screen up front, I also went online, and I think these were like $3 each. All these are RJ45's breakouts, regular Ethernet breakouts. So I got eight wires to work with. Plug them on in. And I did it on both sides because on this side, I had not only have, let's bring it on over here, the screen itself plugged into the RJ45, but I also have four more wires to work with because this only has power and ground and signal and ground. So that's four. The other four I have wired up, one for lithium iron phosphate, the actual to monitor the battery pack, and one for the super caps. So this way I can see the difference and the voltages when the car is starting, running, whichever, and I can me measure the amperage and keep an eye on it with this unit. So it's perfect, it works great. And I got a 20 foot spool of cheap $3.50 Cat5 unshielded cable. It's not like I really need it shielded for what I'm doing. So this way I can run the battery in the back of the trunk and I can have my screens all the way up front. And it works beautifully, at least in the mock-up right now, because it's running through the 20 foot of cable as we speak. <clears throat> so now, I've explained, yes, I have a lead acid battery off to the side here. Power comes on in, goes through the relay, then it goes back on out. Um, let's see here. Your positive runs through the half ohm resistor. And what this does is basically when the super caps, let me see if I can slide everything down here a little bit. 
when the super caps are done starting a car, they're probably going to sit around 12 volts until the alternator starts kicking in and charging it back up. Well, this keeps the amount of current down to about 5 amps maximum coming from the battery to continue charging the super caps and vice versa. Once the alternator recharges these back up to about 14.1 volts, power can flow back through and recharge the battery, again regulating it at about 5 amps maximum, considering the battery might hit 12 volts and this will be at 14.4. You're working with only about a 2 or 3 volt difference. So that should limit it around 5 amps, which is perfect for any battery. And that's how you keep from killing batteries. Now, the supercapacitor pack itself, we're going to do this in the next video. We're going to build one of these. Actually, I need to build four more of these. And these are the final versions of what's going to happen. Originally, you start with one of these six cell boards. Well, since I'm using Amperex, these little supercapacitors I showed the video of before, the three volt 400 farad capacitors, I only need five of these to make a 15 volt pack. So we, I'm going to show you how to modify this board because this board is meant for six cells and 2.7 volts. We're going to modify it for three volts and only five cells because we actually need to build four more of these. I'm going to have five of these stacked together in parallel and then run a big giant bus bar across. Now, there are two ways of protection right on this board itself. One is three volt protection for each cell. It keeps them from going over voltage. They like to call these boards balance boards. They're not balance boards. The only time they balance is if you bring this all the way up to 15 volts and you actually have all the LEDs and all these things actually protecting all the circuits. Then yes, it's a balance board. But if you're floating all the cells at like 2.8 or 2.7 volts, it's not doing a damn thing. None whatsoever. It's not a balance board. It's a over voltage protection board. For balancing, I'm using the SAB MOSFETs. These ones happen to be the ALD8100 23, 2.3 volt rated ones. So this way it's always working. And I really haven't had any problems with it. It works really good for balancing. And that works as long as these super caps are 2.3 volts or above, it will shuffle the power around and make sure they are all balanced really close, usually within about a tenth of a volt. And that is balancing. So we have protection and we have balancing all in a single stack. So that is the basic premise of what I'm working with. I want to have a system that will work as a battery, start, starting battery and running battery for a car that will last longer than the car. The supercapacitors definitely will. And if we treat the lithium iron phosphate battery good, it should last as long as the car itself. None of this lead acid dying within every three or four years type of deal. And this won't care about high heat in the summer, unless you live in the Amazon or something like that. And definitely won't care about starting in winter time because the supercaps, which actually do the starting for the car, they don't care about the cold. So I can't wait. Once I have this built and we hit the dead of winter and it's like a negative five degrees in Delaware, which barely ever happens by the way, but it does get really cold and you get that sluggish start, I'll bet you 10 to one and I will do a video of this come winter time, it'll crank right over. It won't care because super caps still work at low temperatures and even the lithium iron phosphate battery. All it's doing is keeping everything trickle charged at maybe 20 milliamps. That battery will not care at that temperature to keep a little bit of a trickle charge. So this will work great in a wide temperature span and a lot of longevity. That's the whole idea behind this. So next, next two videos are basically set up. I have two sponsorships. One from Amperex. They're sending me an extra 15 super caps so I can build the rest of the supercapacitor array. And we're going to show you how to build this in the next video. The other sponsor is going to be Stark Power. They are sponsoring two other 9 amp hour, 12 volt rated lithium iron phosphate deep cycle batteries. Wow, that was a mouthful. But they're going to send me two. One for actually use in this unit to replace the lead acid that we're just using for the mock-up right now. And the second one, so I can tear it down and actually see how good it is. So 
Those videos will be right after we're done with the super caps. And then we'll actually start putting everything together in this nice little case and get it ready for being put in the trunk of my car. This, this case is a little too big to fit where the battery originally was and it will fit perfectly in the trunk. So we have a few videos to go here. Keep tuned. I will probably make a playlist out of this. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down below. I need thumbs ups if you can. Thank you very much.